In 2012, National Geographic published this photograph of a cat which fluoresced under black light. This fluorescence was due to the cat receiving a gene from a jellyfish and represents great leaps in science which may aid us in future conservation efforts. So it's going to be a rough couple of decades for life on Earth. According to many conservation scientists, anywhere from 15 to 40 percent of all of Earth's species may be extinct by 2050. Many species are going extinct due to the inability to adapt to accelerating environmental changes. Due to low population sizes, some species have become inbred. This means there is a large amount of genetic similarity among these populations. This can be a bad thing, as the following example will show. Let's say I have two population of cats. One population has high genetic variation. To focus on one trait, this population has coats that vary from white to black. In the second population, due to inbreeding, all cats have black coats. Now let's say a change in the environment kills cats who have black coats. In the first population, most of the cats will survive. This population of cats will remain strong and continue to fill the role they always had in their environment. The second population will go extinct because it is not resilient to the environmental change. Under normal circumstances, naturally occurring mutations would work to increase the variation of a population, while the environment will reduce variation through natural selection. This is all good if the environment changes slowly, but the mutation rates cannot keep up with the rate of change caused by humans and climate change. In order to preserve species, humans may need to utilize the drastic tools of genetic screening and engineering. There are three ways conservationists can manipulate the genetics of a population. One traditional way conservationists combat the lack of variation in a gene pool within a population is to bring in similar species or subspecies into the environment to mate with the current inbred population. Now, with advances in genetic screening, we can analyze the DNA of both the inbred population and individuals from outside in order to maximize the variation within the gene pool. This involves collection of cell samples, followed by removal of genetic material, and digestion with a series of enzymes. The resulted sort shorter sequences are then copied using polymerase chain reactions or in bacteria. The copies are labeled with radioactive atoms that can be read by machines. Though the cost in time and money to obtain a complete sequence of DNA has decreased, typically the full sequence of DNA is not used, only small pieces. Sometimes mitochondrial DNA is sequenced, sometimes only small segments called microsatellites are sequenced. These sequences can be saved and analyzed in a process known as DNA barcoding. These genetic barcodes can be compared to determine optimal populations to introduce to the inbred population. This strategy was successful in the case of the Florida panther, where both population size and genetic diversity increased after Texas pumas were introduced to the area, and it is also currently being discussed as a way to save the Amur leopard. The Amur leopard is a species with severe inbreeding depression, and only less than 40 individuals are known to be in the wild. By introducing a similar species analyzed for optimal genetic material, variation may be increased, which may bring the species back from the brink. Altering the genetics of a population through selective introduction has strengths and weaknesses. The process is relatively non-invasive compared to other genetic manipulation techniques, and has had a proven track records to increase localized population sizes and variations within the gene pool. However, there are some weaknesses to this technique. In wild populations, the correct individuals may not always mate. Also, by introducing genetics from outside populations, you may dilute some of the adaptive genetics within the native population. This may result in a decreased fitness of individuals. Additionally, the outside population may transfer parasites or disease from their original location to the local population, and the local population may not have resistance to these diseases. A second way scientists could manipulate the genetics of a population is through genetic engineering. Advantageous genes can be transferred within a species. Agricultural crops and livestock have undergone these genetic manipulations to increase yield and monetary values of the organisms. To genetically modify an organism, first the advantageous gene needs to be located. This is done by first observing the population for individuals who display beneficial characteristics. Next, you determine the gene that provides the characteristic by sequencing the DNA of a series of individuals who display that trait. Once a gene is isolated, the gene is cut out of a donor cell using biochemical reactions and added to an engineered virus. The virus is then added to a developing embryo. The virus attacks the developing cells and introduces the beneficial gene. This is currently being investigated in a variety of wild species, though actual manipulation has yet to occur in published literature. For example, a gene leading to heat resistance in rainbow trout has been isolated and may be used to increase the trout survival rate in rivers and oceans as the average global temperature increases. The strengths to this process are that the genes come from within the species, so there is no issue introducing foreign diseases or parasites. Also, scientists are able to target specific genes so other traits are not diluted or otherwise affected. However, there are weaknesses to this method. One, it is very costly and time-consuming to find and target specific genes. 
Two, most of the more complex traits within an organism are polygenetic, meaning there are multiple genes associated with the adaptive trait. This adds to the complexity and cost of the process. Three, in order to be incorporated, the genes have to be introduced when the organism is in the embryonic stage, and not every gene transfer is a success. The whole process must happen in a lab under set conditions. Four, each host embryo has to be inserted into a host mother and gestated for a normal period of time. This increases the cost and time of the process. There is a third similar way to modify the genetics of a population in order to increase fitness. This is to create transgenetic organisms. Transgenic organism is an organism which contains two or more species genetic material. This technique is similar to the previously described technique and has been used in agriculture for decades to create crops resistant to harsh conditions and afflictions that their non-modified relatives would succumb to. This is where the glow in the dark cat from National Geographic comes in. See, what they have done is combined a luminescent gene from a jellyfish with a feline HIV resistant gene from a monkey. They then inserted both genes into a cat embryo using a virus. These glowing cats are feline HIV resistant. Similar advantageous traits may be added to an at-risk population from an outside species. This allows for even greater genetic fitness and variability than transferring genes from within a species. However, in addition to the previously discussed disadvantages, this could possibly have potentially unforeseen consequences. Altering the DNA of an organism to make it more fit could alter its competitiveness within a food chain and drastically alter the makeup of the ecosystems, causing more harm than good. While genetic manipulation may be a necessary resource to minimize the impacts of the sixth great extinction we are currently facing, it needs to be approached with caution. If applied correctly though, genetic manipulation can cause more good than harm. I also believe techniques will improve and this will be a way of preserving species for future generations. But I do also agree that funding and resources still need to go into understanding basic ways these ecosystems work, and also regions and species still need to be protected in the old-fashioned ways. This is not a magic bullet. Thanks for watching Science Scenes. It takes a lot of time and energy to make these videos and hope to produce more content soon. If you could, subscribe or click like or leave me some positive feedback or constructive criticism in the comments. Thanks and I'll see you next time.